Korean Airlines Flight 007, also known as KAL 007 and KE 007, was a scheduled Korean Airlines flight from New York City to Seoul via Anchorage, Alaska. On 1 September 1983, the South Korean airliner serving the flight was shot down by a Soviet Su-15 interceptor. A Boeing 747 airliner was en route from Anchorage to Seoul, but deviated from its original planned route and flew through Soviet prohibited airspace about the time of a U.S. aerial reconnaissance mission. The Soviet Air Forces treated the unidentified aircraft as an intruding U.S. spy plane, and proceeded to destroy it with air-to-air -air missiles, after firing warning shots which were likely not seen by the CAL pilots. The Korean airliner eventually crashed in the sea near Moneron Island west of Sakhalin in the Sea of Japan. All 269 passengers and crew aboard were killed, including Larry McDonald, a United States representative from Georgia. The Soviets found the wreckage under the sea on September 15, and found the flight recorders in October, but this information was kept secret until 1993. The Soviet Union initially denied knowledge of the incident, but later admitted shooting down the aircraft, claiming that it was on a MASINT spy mission. The Politburo of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union said it was a deliberate provocation by the United States to probe the Soviet Union's military preparedness, or even to provoke a war. The White House accused the Soviet Union of obstructing search and rescue operations. The Soviet armed forces suppressed evidence sought by the International Civil Aviation Organization (ICAO) investigation, such as the flight recorders, which were released 8 years later after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. The incident was one of the most tense moments of the Cold War and resulted in an escalation of anti-Soviet sentiment, particularly in the United States. As a result of the incident, the United States altered tracking procedures for aircraft departing from Alaska. The interface of the autopilot used on airliners was redesigned to make it more ergonomic. In addition, the incident was one of the most important events that prompted the Reagan administration to allow worldwide access to the United States Global Positioning System GPS. Topic. Details of the flight Topic. Passengers and crew The aircraft flying as Korean Airlines Flight 007 was a Boeing 747-230B registered HL7442. The aircraft departed Gate 15 of John F. Kennedy International Airport, New York City on August 30, 1983, bound for Gimpo International Airport in Gangseo District, Seoul, 35 minutes behind its scheduled departure time of 23.50 Eastern Daylight Saving Time, 3.50 Coordinated Universal Time, August 31. The flight was carrying 246 passengers and 23 crew members. After refueling at Anchorage International Airport in Anchorage, Alaska, the aircraft, piloted on this leg of the journey by Captain Chun Byung In, First Officer Sun Dong Hui, and Flight Engineer Kim Yui Dong, departed for Seoul at 4 o'clock AHDT (1300 Coordinated Universal Time) on August 31, 1983. The aircrew had an unusually high ratio of crew to passengers, as six deadheading crew were on board. Twelve passengers occupied the upper deck first class, while in business almost all of 24 seats were taken. In economy class, approximately 80 seats did not contain passengers. There were 22 children under the age of 12 years aboard. 130 passengers planned to connect to other destinations such as Tokyo, Hong Kong, and Taipei. United States Congressman Larry McDonald from Georgia, who at the time was also the second president of the conservative John Birch Society, was on the flight. 
Senator Jesse Helms of North Carolina, Senator Steve Sims of Idaho, and Representative Carol Hubbard of Kentucky who canceled his reservations for the trip at the last moment were aboard sister flight Cal 015, which flew 15 minutes behind Cal 007. They were headed, along with McDonald on Cal 007, to Seoul, South Korea, in order to attend the ceremonies for the 30th anniversary of the U.S.-South Korea Mutual Defense Treaty. The Soviets contended former U.S. President Richard Nixon was to have been seated next to Larry McDonald on Cal 007 but that the CIA warned him not to go. According to the New York Post and Telegraph Agency of the Soviet Union TASS, this was denied by Nixon. <laughs> Flight deviation from assigned route After taking off from Anchorage, the flight was instructed by Air Traffic Control ATC to turn to a heading of 220 degrees. Approximately 90 seconds later, ATC directed the flight to proceed direct Bethel when able. Upon arriving over Bethel, Alaska, Flight 007 entered the northernmost of five 50-mile wide airways, known as the NOPAC North Pacific routes, that bridge the Alaskan and Japanese coasts. Cal 07's particular airway, R-20 Romeo 20, passes just 17.5 miles from what was then Soviet airspace off the coast of the Kamchatka Peninsula. The autopilot system used at the time had four basic control modes, heading, VOR, LOCK, ILS, and INS. The heading mode maintained a constant magnetic course selected by the pilot. The VOR, LOCK mode maintained the plane on a specific course, transmitted from a VOR VHF omnidirectional range, a type of short-range radio signal transmitted from ground beacons or localizer LOCK beacon selected by the pilot. The ILS instrument landing system mode caused the plane to track both vertical and lateral course beacons, which led to a specific runway selected by the pilot. The INS inertial navigation system mode maintained the plane on lateral course lines between selected flight plan waypoints programmed into the INS computer. When the INS navigation systems were properly programmed with the filed flight plan waypoints, the pilot could turn the autopilot mode selector switch to the INS position and the plane would then automatically track the programmed INS course line, provided the plane was headed in the proper direction and within 7.5 miles .1 km of that course line. If, however, the plane was more than 7.5 miles .1 km from the flight plan course line when the pilot turned the autopilot mode selector from heading to INS, the plane would continue to track the heading selected in heading mode as long as the actual position of the plane was more than 7.5 miles .1 km from the programmed INS course line. The autopilot computer software commanded the INS mode to remain in the armed condition until the plane had moved to a position less than 7.5 miles .1 km from the desired course line. Once that happened, the INS mode would change from «armed» to «capture» and the plane would track the flight plan course from then on the heading mode of the autopilot would normally be engaged sometime after takeoff to comply with vectors from ATC and then after receiving appropriate ATC clearance to guide the plane to intercept the desired ins course line the anchorage vor beacon was not operational because of maintenance the crew received a NOTAM notice to airmen of this fact, which was not seen as a problem, as the captain could still check his position at the next VORTAC beacon at Bethel, 346 miles 557 km away. The aircraft was required to maintain the assigned heading of 220 degrees, until it could receive the signals from Bethel, then it could fly direct to Bethel, as instructed by ATC, by centering the VOR. Course Deviation Indicator and then engaging the autopilot in the VOR – LOCK mode. Then, when over the Bethel beacon, the flight could start using INS mode to follow the waypoints that make up Route Romeo 20 around the coast of the USSR to Seoul. The INS mode was necessary for this route, since after Bethel the plane would be mostly out of range from VOR stations. 
At about 10 minutes after takeoff, Cal 007, flying on a heading of 245 degrees, began to deviate to the right north of its assigned route to Bethel, and continued to fly on this constant heading for the next five and a half hours. International Civil Aviation Organization simulation and analysis of the flight data recorder determined that this deviation was probably caused by the aircraft's autopilot system operating in heading mode, after the point that it should have been switched to the INS mode. According to the ICAO, the autopilot was not operating in the INS mode either because the crew did not switch the autopilot to the INS mode shortly after Cairn Mountain, or they did select the INS mode, but the computer did not transition from inertial navigation armed to INS mode because the aircraft had already deviated off track by more than the 7.5 miles .1 kilometers tolerance permitted by the inertial navigation computer. Whatever the reason, the autopilot remained in the heading mode, and the problem was not detected by the crew. At 28 minutes after takeoff, civilian radar at Kenai Peninsula on the eastern shore of Cook Inlet and with radar coverage 175 miles west of Anchorage, tracked Cal 007 5.6 miles north of where it should have been. When Cal 007 did not reach Bethel at 50 minutes after takeoff, a military Radar at King Salmon, Alaska, tracked Cal 007 at 12.6 nautical miles .3 kilometers north of where it should have been. There is no evidence to indicate that civil air traffic controllers or military radar personnel at Elmendorf Air Force Base who were in a position to receive the King Salmon radar output were aware of Cal 07's deviation in real time, and therefore able to warn the aircraft. It had exceeded its expected maximum deviation sixfold, two nautical miles kilometers of error being the maximum expected drift from course if the inertial navigation system was activated. Cal 07's divergence prevented the aircraft from transmitting its position via shorter range very high frequency radio. VHF. It therefore requested Cal 015, also en route to Seoul, to relay reports to air traffic control on its behalf. Cal 007 requested Cal 015 to relay its position three times. At 14.43 Coordinated Universal Time, Cal 007 directly transmitted a change of estimated time of arrival for its next waypoint, NEEVA, to the International Flight Service Station at Anchorage, but it did so over the longer range high frequency radio HF rather than VHF. HF transmissions are able to carry a longer distance than VHF, but are vulnerable to electromagnetic interference and static. VHF is clearer with less interference, and preferred by flight crews. The inability to establish direct radio communications to be able to transmit their position directly did not alert the pilots of Cal 007 of their ever increasing divergence and was not considered unusual by air traffic controllers. Halfway between Bethel and Waypoint NABIE, Cal 007 passed through the southern portion of the North American Aerospace Defense Command buffer zone. This zone is north of Romeo 20 and off limits to civilian aircraft. Some time after leaving American territorial waters, Cal Flight 007 crossed the international date line, where the local date shifted from August 31, 1983, to September 1, 1983. Cal 007 continued its journey, ever increasing its deviation—60 nautical miles off-course at waypoint NABIE, 100 nautical miles off-course at waypoint NUKKS, and 160 nautical miles off-course at waypoint NEEVA—until it reached the Kamchatka Peninsula. Topic. Shoot down In 1983, Cold War tensions between the United States and Soviet Union had escalated to a level not seen since the Cuban Missile Crisis because of several factors. These included the United States Strategic Defense Initiative, its planned deployment of the Pershing II weapon system in Europe in March and April, and Fleetex 83 the largest naval exercise held to date in the North Pacific. 
The military hierarchy of the Soviet Union particularly the old guard led by Soviet General Secretary Yuri Andropov and Minister of Defense Dmitry Ustinov viewed these actions as bellicose and destabilizing, they were deeply suspicious of U.S. President Ronald Reagan's intentions and openly fearful he was planning a pre-emptive nuclear strike against the Soviet Union. These fears culminated in Ryan, the code name for a secret intelligence gathering program initiated by Andropov to detect a potential nuclear sneak attack which he believed Reagan was plotting. Aircraft from USS Midway and USS Enterprise repeatedly overflew Soviet military installations in the Kuril Islands during Fleetex 83, resulting in the dismissal or reprimanding of Soviet military officials who had been unable to shoot them down. On the Soviet side, Ryan was expanded. Lastly, there was a heightened alert around the Kamchatka Peninsula at the time Cal 007 was in the vicinity, because of a Soviet missile test at the Kura missile test range that was scheduled for the same day. A United States Air Force Boeing RC-135 reconnaissance aircraft flying in the area was monitoring the missile test off the peninsula at 15:51 coordinated universal time, according to Soviet sources. Cal 007 entered the restricted airspace of the Kamchatka Peninsula. The buffer zone extended 200 kilometers (120 miles) from Kamchatka's coast and is known as a flight information region (FIR). The 100 km miles radius of the buffer zone nearest to Soviet territory had the additional designation of prohibited airspace. When Cal 007 was about 130 km miles from the Kamchatka coast, four MiG-23 fighters were scrambled to intercept the Boeing 747. Significant command and control problems were experienced trying to vector the fast military jets onto the Boeing before they ran out of fuel. In addition, pursuit was made more difficult, according to Soviet Air Force Captain Alexander Zuyev, who defected to the West in 1989, because ten days before Arctic gales had knocked out the key warning radar on the Kamchatka Peninsula. Furthermore he stated that local officials responsible for repairing the radar lied to Moscow, falsely reporting that they had successfully fixed the radar. Had this radar been operational, it would have enabled an intercept of the stray airliner roughly two hours earlier with plenty of time for proper identification as a civilian aircraft. But instead, the unidentified jetliner crossed over the Kamchatka Peninsula back into international airspace over the Sea of Okhotsk without being intercepted. In his explanation to 60 Minutes, Zuyev stated, Some people lied to Moscow, trying to save their ass. The commander of the Soviet Far East District Air Defense Forces, General Valery Kamensky, was adamant that Cal 007 was to be destroyed even over neutral waters but only after positive identification showed it not to be a passenger plane. His subordinate, General Anatoly Kornilkov, commander of Sokol Air Base and later to become commander of the Russian Air Force, insisted that there was no need to make positive identification as the intruder had already flown over the Kamchatka Peninsula. General Kornilkov, to Military District Headquarters Gen. Kamensky, 547. Simply destroy it even if it is over neutral waters? Are the orders to destroy it over neutral waters? Oh, well, Kamensky. We must find out, maybe it is some civilian craft or God knows who. Kornilkov. What civilian? It has flown over Kamchatka. It came from the ocean without identification. I am giving the order to attack if it crosses the state border. Units of the Soviet Air Defense Forces that had been tracking the South Korean aircraft for more than an hour while it entered and left Soviet airspace now classified the aircraft as a military target when it re entered their airspace over Sakhalin. After the protracted ground-controlled interception, the three Su-15 fighters from nearby Dolinsk Sokol Air Base and the MiG-23 from Smyrnik Air Base managed to make visual contact with the Boeing. The pilot of the lead Su-15 fighter fired warning shots, but recalled later in 1991, I fired four bursts, more than 200 rounds. For all the good it did. After all, I was loaded with armor-piercing shells, not incendiary shells. It's doubtful whether anyone could see them. 
At this point, Cal 007 contacted Tokyo Area Control Center, requesting clearance to ascend to a higher flight level for reasons of fuel economy. The request was granted, so the Boeing started to climb, gradually slowing as it exchanged speed for altitude. The decrease in speed caused the pursuing fighter to overshoot the Boeing and was interpreted by the Soviet pilot as an evasive maneuver. The order to shoot Cal 007 down was given as it was about to leave Soviet airspace for the second time. At around 1826 Coordinated Universal Time, under pressure from General Kornikov, and ground controllers not to let the aircraft escape into international airspace, the lead fighter was able to move back into a position where it could fire two K-8 NATO reporting name AA-3 ANAB air-to-air -air missiles at the plane. Topic. Soviet pilots' recollection of shootdown In a 1991 interview with Izvestia, Major Gennady Osipovich, pilot of the Su-15 interceptor that shot the 747 down, spoke about his recollections of the events leading up to the shootdown. Contrary to official Soviet statements at the time, he recalled telling ground controllers that there were blinking lights. He continued, saying that, I saw two rows of windows and knew that this was a Boeing. I knew this was a civilian plane. But for me this meant nothing. It is easy to turn a civilian type of plane into one for military use. He furthermore did not provide a detailed description of the aircraft to the ground controllers. I did not tell the ground that it was a Boeing type plane, they did not ask me. Commenting on the moment that Cal 007 slowed as it ascended from flight level 330 to flight level 350, and then on his maneuvering for missile launch, Osipovich said, They Cal 007, quickly lowered their speed. They were flying at 400 km per hour, 249 miles per hour. My speed was more than 400. I was simply unable to fly slower. In my opinion, the intruder's intentions were plain. If I did not want to go into a stall, I would be forced to overshoot them. That's exactly what happened. We had already flown over the island, Sakhalin. It is narrow at that point, the target was about to get away. Then the ground controller gave the command, Destroy the target. That was easy to say. But how? With shells. I had already expended 243 rounds. Ram it? I had always thought of that as poor taste. Ramming is the last resort. Just in case, I had already completed my turn and was coming down on top of him. Then, I had an idea. I dropped below him about 2,000 meters 6, feet. Afterburners. Switched on the missiles and brought the nose up sharply. Success. I have a lock on. We shot down the plane legally. Later we began to lie about small details, the plane was supposedly flying without running lights or strobe light, that tracer bullets were fired, or that I had radio contact with them on the emergency frequency of 121.5 MHz. <laughs> Soviet command hierarchy of shootdown The Soviet real-time military communication transcripts of the shootdown suggest the chain of command from the top general to Major Osipovich, the Su-15 interceptor pilot who shot down Cal 007. In reverse order, they are Major Gennady Osipovich Captain Titovnin, Combat Control Center, Fighter Division Lieutenant Colonel Maestrenko, Smyrnik Air Base Fighter Division Acting Chief of Staff, who confirmed the shootdown order to Titovnin. Titovnin, you confirm the task? Maestrenko, yes. Lieutenant Colonel Gerasimenko, Acting Commander, 41st Fighter Regiment. Gerasimenko, to Kornikov, task received. Destroy targets 60 to 65 with missile fire. Accept control of fighter from Smyrnik. General Anatoly Kornikov, commander of Sokol Air Base, Sakhalin. 
Kornukov, to Gerasimenko I repeat the task, fire the missiles, fire on target 60-65. Destroy target 60-65. Take control of the MiG-23 from Smyrnik, call sign 163, call sign 163 he is behind the target at the moment. Destroy the target. Carry out the task, destroy it. General Valery Kamensky, commander of Far East Military District Air Defense Forces. Kornukov, to Kamensky. Simply destroy it, even if it is over neutral waters? Are the orders to destroy it over neutral waters? Oh, well. Army General Ivan Moiseevich Tretiak, commander of the Far East Military District. Weapons were used, weapons authorized at the highest level. Ivan Moiseevich authorized it. Hello, hello. Say again. I cannot hear you clearly now. He gave the order. Hello, hello, hello. Yes, yes. Ivan Moiseevich gave the order, Tretiak. Roger, roger. Weapons were used at his order. Topic: <laughs> Post-attack flight. At the time of the attack, the plane had been cruising at an altitude of about 35,000 feet 11, meters. Tapes recovered from the airliner's cockpit voice recorder indicate that the crew were unaware that they were off course and violating Soviet airspace. Immediately after missile detonation, the airliner began a 113-second arc upward because of a damaged crossover cable between the left inboard and right outboard elevators. At 18 hours 26 minutes and 46 seconds Coordinated Universal Time, 3:26 Japan Time, 6:26 Sakhalin Time, at the apex of the arc at altitude 38,250 feet (11,660 meters), the autopilot disengaged. This was either done by the pilots, or it disengaged automatically. Now being controlled manually, the plane began to descend to 35,000 feet 11, meters. From 18 hours 27 minutes and 1 second until 18 hours 27 minutes and 9 seconds, the flight crew reports to Tokyo Area Control Center informing that Cal 007 to descend to 10,000 feet 3, meters. At 18 hours 27 minutes and 20 seconds, ICAO graphing a digital flight data recorder tapes show that after a descent phase in a 10-second nose up, Cal 007 is now leveled out at pre-missile detonation altitude of 35,000 feet 11,000 meters. Forward acceleration is now back to pre-missile detonation rate of zero acceleration, and airspeed has returned to pre-detonation velocity. Your oscillations, begun at the time of missile detonation, continue decreasingly until the end of the minute 44 second section of the tape. The Boeing did not break up, explode or plummet immediately after the attack. It continued its gradual descent for 4 minutes, then leveled off at 16,424 feet 5,006 meters 1830 to 1831 Coordinated Universal Time, rather than continue descending to 10,000 3,000 meters, as previously reported to Tokyo Area Control Center, continuing at this altitude for almost 5 more minutes 1835 Coordinated Universal Time. The last cockpit voice recorder entry occurred at 18 hours 27 minutes and 46 seconds while in this phase of the descent. At 18.28 Coordinated Universal Time, the aircraft was reported turning to the north. ICAO analysis concluded that the flight crew retained limited control of the aircraft. However, this only lasted for five minutes. The crew then lost all control. The aircraft began to descend rapidly in spirals over Moneron Island for 2.6 miles (4.2 kilometers). The aircraft then broke apart in midair and crashed into the ocean, just off the west coast of the Sakhalin Island. All 269 people on board were killed instantly from blunt trauma. The aircraft was last seen visually by Osipovich, somehow descending slowly over Moneron Island. 
The aircraft disappeared off long-range military radar at Wakanai, Japan at a height of 1,000 feet 300 meters. Cal 007 was probably attacked in international airspace, with a 1993 Russian report listing the location of the missile firing outside its territory at 46 degrees 46 minutes 27 seconds north 141 degrees 32 minutes 48 seconds east, although the intercepting pilot stated otherwise in a subsequent interview. Initial reports that the airliner had been forced to land on Sakhalin were soon proven false. One of these reports conveyed via phone by Orville Brockman, the Washington office spokesman of the Federal Aviation Administration, to the press secretary of Larry MacDonald, was that the FAA in Tokyo had been informed by the Japanese Civil Aviation Bureau that Japanese Self-Defense Force radar confirms that the Hokkaido radar followed Air Korea to a landing in Soviet territory on the island of Saklinska and it is confirmed by the manifest that Congressman MacDonald is on board." A Japanese fisherman aboard 58th Chidori Maru later reported to the Japanese Maritime Safety Agency this report was cited by ICAO analysis that he had heard a plane at low altitude, but had not seen it. Then he heard, "...a loud sound followed by a bright flash of light on the horizon, then another dull sound and a less intense flash of light on the horizon," and smelled aviation fuel. <inaudible> <inaudible> Soviet command response to post-detonation flight Though the interceptor pilot reported to ground control, "...target destroyed." The Soviet command, from general on down, indicated surprise and consternation at Cal 07's continued flight, and ability to regain its altitude and maneuver. This consternation continued through to Cal 07's subsequent level flight at altitude 16,424 feet 5,006 meters, and then, after almost five minutes, through its spiral descent over Moneron Island. See Korean Airlines Flight 007 transcripts from 1826 Coordinated Universal Time onwards, Lt. Cole. Novosletsky, well, what is happening, what is the matter, who guided him in? He locked on why didn't he shoot it down? Topic. Missile damage to plane the following damage to the aircraft was determined by the ICAO from its analysis of the flight data recorder and cockpit voice recorder. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Hydraulics. Cal 007 had four redundant hydraulic systems of which systems 1, 2, and 3 were damaged or destroyed. There was no evidence of damage to system 4. The hydraulics provided actuation of all primary and secondary flight controls except leading edge slats in the latter as well as of landing gear attraction, extension, gear steering, and wheel braking. Each primary flight control axis received power from all four hydraulic systems. Upon missile detonation, the jumbo jet began to experience oscillations yawing, as the dual-channel yaw damper was damaged. Yawing would not have occurred if hydraulic systems 1 or 2 were fully operational. The result is that the control column did not thrust forward upon impact, it should have done so as the plane was on autopilot, to bring down the plane to its former altitude of 35,000 feet 11,000 meters. This failure of the autopilot to correct the rise in altitude indicates that hydraulic system number 3, which operates the autopilot actuator, a system controlling the plane's elevators, was damaged or out. Cal 07's airspeed and acceleration rate both began to decrease as the plane began to climb. At 20 seconds after missile detonation a click was heard in the cabin, which is identified as the automatic pilot disconnect warning sound. Either the pilot or co-pilot had disconnected the autopilot and was manually thrusting the control column forward in order to bring the plane lower. Though the autopilot had been turned off, manual mode did not begin functioning for another 20 seconds. This failure of the manual system to engage upon command indicates failure in hydraulic systems 1 and 2. With wing flaps up. Control was reduced to the right inboard aileron and the innermost of spoiler section of each side. Topic: 
Topic: <laughs> Left wing. Contrary to Major Osipovich's statement in 1991 that he had taken off half of Cal 07's left wing, ICAO analysis found that the wing was intact. The interceptor pilot stated that the first missile hit near the tail, while the second missile took off half the left wing of the aircraft. The interceptor's pilot's statement that the second missile took off half of the left wing was probably incorrect. The missiles were fired with a two-second interval and would have detonated at an equal interval. The first detonated at 18 hours 26 minutes and 2 seconds coordinated universal time. The last radio transmissions from KE-007 to Tokyo Radio were between 18 hours 26 minutes and 57 seconds and 18 hours 27 minutes and 15 seconds coordinated universal time using HF high frequency. The HF-1 radio aerial of the aircraft was positioned in the left wing tip suggesting that the left wing tip was intact at this time. Also, the aircraft's maneuvers after the attack did not indicate extensive damage to the left wing. <inaudible> <inaudible> Engines the co-pilot reported to Captain Chun twice during the flight after the missile's detonation, engines normal, sir. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Tail section. The first missile was radar controlled and proximity fused and detonated 50 meters (160 feet) behind the aircraft. Sending fragments forward, it either severed or unraveled the crossover cable from the left inboard elevator to the right elevator. This, with damage to one of the four hydraulic systems, caused Cal 007 to ascend from 35,000 to 38,250 feet 10,670 to 11,660 meters, at which point the autopilot was disengaged. Topic. Fuselage Fragments from the proximity fused air to air missile that detonated 50 meters 160 feet behind the aircraft, punctured the fuselage and caused rapid decompression of the pressurized cabin. The interval of 11 seconds between the sound of missile detonation picked up by the cockpit voice recorder and the sound of the alarm sounding in the cockpit enabled ICAO analysts to determine that the size of the ruptures to the pressurized fuselage was 1.75 square feet, 0.163 square meters. Topic: <laughs> Aircraft <laughs> The aircraft flying as Korean Airlines Flight 007 was a four-engine Boeing 747-230B jet airliner with Boeing serial number 20559. The aircraft first flew on January 28, 1972, and was delivered on March 17, 1972 to German airline Condor with the registration DABYH. It was sold to the ITEL Corporation in February 1979 and leased to Korean Airlines with the registration HL7442. Topic: <laughs> Search and Rescue. As a result of Cold War tensions, the search and rescue operations of the Soviet Union were not coordinated with those of the United States, South Korea, and Japan. Consequently no information was shared, and each side endeavored to harass or obtain evidence to implicate the other. The flight data recorders were the key pieces of evidence sought by both governments, with the United States insisting that an independent observer from the ICAO be present on one of its search vessels in the event that they were found. International boundaries are not well defined on the open sea, leading to numerous confrontations between the large number of opposing naval ships that were assembled in the area. Topic. Soviet search and rescue mission to Moneron Island The Soviets did not acknowledge shooting down the aircraft until September 6, five days after the flight was shot down. 
Eight days after the shootdown, Marshal of the Soviet Union and Chief of General Staff Nikolai Ogarkov denied knowledge of where Cal 007 had gone down. We could not give the precise answer about the spot where it Cal 007 fell because we ourselves did not know the spot in the first place. Nine years later, the Russian Federation handed over transcripts of Soviet military communications that showed that at least two documented search and rescue missions were ordered within a half hour of the attack to the last Soviet verified location of the descending jumbo jet, over Moneron Island. The first search was ordered from Smyrnik Air Base in central Sakhalin at 1847 Coordinated Universal Time, nine minutes after Cal 007 had disappeared from Soviet radar screens and brought rescue helicopters from Komatovo Air Base the military unit at Yuzno Sakhalinsk Airport in southern Sakhalin, and Soviet border troops boats to the area. The second search was ordered eight minutes later by the deputy commander of the Far Eastern Military District, General Strogov, and involved civilian trawlers that were in the area around Moneron. The border guards. What ships do we now have near Moneron Island? If they are civilians, send them there immediately. Moneron is just 4.5 miles (7.2 kilometers) long and 3.5 miles (5.6 kilometers) wide, located 24 miles (39 kilometers) due west of Sakhalin Island at 46 degrees 15 141 degrees 14 e. It is the only land mass in the whole Tartar Straits. Topic. Search for Cal 007 in international waters Immediately after the shootdown, South Korea, owner of the aircraft and therefore prime considerant for jurisdiction, designated the United States and Japan as search and salvage agents, thereby making it illegal for the Soviet Union to salvage the aircraft, providing it was found outside Soviet territorial waters. If it did so, the United States would now be legally entitled to use force against the Soviets, if necessary, to prevent retrieval of any part of the plane. On the same day as the shootdown, Rear Admiral William A. Kokel, Commander, Task Force 71, and a skeleton staff, taken by helicopter from Japan, embarked in USS Badger stationed off Vladivostok at time of the flight on September 9 for further transfer to the destroyer USS Elliot to assume duties as Officer in Tactical Command of the Search and Rescue effort. Surface search began immediately and on into September 13. U.S. underwater operations began on September 14. On September 10, 1983, with no further hope of finding survivors, Task Force 71's mission was reclassified from a «search and rescue» SAR operation to a «search and salvage» shash. On October 17, Rear Admiral Walter T. Piotti Jr. took command of the task force and its search and salvage mission from Rear Admiral Kokel. First to be searched was a 60 square mile, 160 square kilometers, high probability area. This was unsuccessful. On October 21, Task Force 71 extended its search within coordinates encompassing in an arc around the Soviet territorial boundaries north of Moneron Island, an area of 225 square miles, 583 square kilometers, reaching to the west of Sakhalin Island. This was the large probability area the search areas were outside the 12 nautical mile 22 kilometers soviet claimed territorial boundaries the northwestern most point of the search touched the soviet territorial boundary closest to the naval port of nevsk on sakhalin nevsk was 46 nautical miles 85 kilometers from moneron this larger search was also unsuccessful. The vessels used in the search, for the Soviet side as well as the U.S. side US, South Korea, Japan, were both civilian trawlers, especially equipped for both the SAR and Shash operations, and various types of warships and support ships. The Soviet side also employed both civilian and military divers. The Soviet search, beginning on the day of the shootdown and continuing until November 6, was confined to the 60 square mile, 160 square kilometers, high probability area in international waters and within Soviet territorial waters to the north of Moneron Island. 
The area within Soviet territorial waters was off limits to the US, South Korean, and Japanese boats. From September 3 to 29, four ships from South Korea had joined in the search. P.O.T. Jr., commander of Task Force 71 of 7th Fleet would summarize the U.S. and Allied, and then the Soviets, search and salvage operations. Not since the search for the hydrogen bomb lost off Palomares, Spain, has the U.S. Navy undertaken a search effort of the magnitude or import of the search for the wreckage of Cal Flight 007. Within six days of the downing of Cal 007, the Soviets had deployed six ships to the general crash site area. Over the next eight weeks of observation by U.S. naval units this number grew to a daily average of 19 Soviet naval, naval-associated and commercial but undoubtedly naval subordinated ships in the search and salvage shash area. The number of Soviet ships in the Shash area over this period ranged from a minimum of 6 to a maximum of 32 and included at least 48 different ships comprising 40 different ship classes. These missions met with interference by the Soviets, in violation of the 1972 Incident at Sea Agreement, and included false flag and fake light signals, sending an armed boarding party to threaten to board a U.S. chartered Japanese auxiliary vessel, blocked by U.S. warship interposition, interfering with a helicopter coming off the USS Elliot. September 7, attempted ramming of rigs used by the South Koreans in their quadrant search, hazardous maneuvering of Gavril Sarichev and knee collision with the U.S. SS Callahan, September 15, 18, removing U.S. sonars, setting false pingers in deep international waters, sending back fire bombers armed with air-to-surface nuclear-armed missiles to threaten U.S. naval units, crisscrossing in front of U.S. combatant vessels, October 26, cutting and attempted cutting of moorings of Japanese auxiliary vessels, particularly Kaiko Maru 3, and radar lock-ons by a Soviet Kara-class cruiser, Petropavlovske, and a Kashin-class destroyer. Odarany, targeting U.S. naval ships and the U.S. Coast Guard cutter USCGC Munro, WHEC 724, USS Towers, escorting USS Conserva, experienced all of the above interference and was involved in a near collision with Odarany, September 23-27, according to the ICAO. The location of the main wreckage was not determined. The approximate position was 46 degrees 34, 141 degrees 17 e, which was in international waters. This point is about 41 miles 66 km from Moneron Island, about 45 miles 72 km from the shore of Sakhalin and 33 miles 53 km from the point of attack. Piotr Jr., commander of Task Force 71 of 7th Fleet, believed the search for Cal 007 in international waters to have been a search in the wrong place and assessed. Had TF Task Force 71 been permitted to search without restriction imposed by claimed territorial waters, the aircraft stood a good chance of having been found. No wreckage of Cal 007 was found. However, the operation established, with a 95% or above confidence level, that the wreckage, or any significant portion of the aircraft, does not lie within the probability area outside the 12 nautical mile area claimed by the Soviets as their territorial limit. At a hearing of the ICAO on September 15, 1983, J. Lynn Helms, the head of the Federal Aviation Administration, stated, the USSR has refused to permit search and rescue units from other countries to enter Soviet territorial waters to search for the remains of Cal 007. Moreover, the Soviet Union has blocked access to the likely crash site and has refused to cooperate with other interested parties, to ensure prompt recovery of all technical equipment, wreckage and other material. <laughs> Human remains and artifacts <laughs> Surface finds. No body parts were recovered by the Soviet search team from the surface of the sea in their territorial waters, though they would later turn over clothes and shoes to a joint U.S.-Japanese delegation to Nevis Gonsaklin. 
On Monday, September 26, 1983, a delegation of seven Japanese and U.S. officials arriving aboard the Japanese patrol boat Sugaru, had met a six-man Soviet delegation at the port of Nevesk on Sakhalin Island. KGB Major General A.I. Romanenko, the commander of the Sakhalin and Kuril Islands Frontier Guard, headed the Soviet delegation. Romanenko handed over to the U.S. and the Japanese, among other things, single and paired footwear. With footwear that the Japanese also retrieved, the total came to 213 men's, women's and children's dress shoes, sandals, and sports shoes. The Soviets indicated these items were all that they had retrieved floating or on the shores of Sakhalin and Moneron Islands. Family members of Cal 007 passengers later stated that these shoes were worn by their loved ones for the flight. Sonia Munda had no difficulty recognizing the sneakers of her children, one of Christian age 14 and one of Lisi age 17, by the intricate way her children laced them. Another mother says, I recognize them just like that. You see, there are all kinds of inconspicuous marks which strangers do not notice. This is how I recognize them. My daughter loved to wear them. Another mother, Nan Oldham, identified her son John's sneakers from a photo in Life magazine of 55 of the 213 shoes apparently, a random array on display those first days at Chitto's Air Force Base in Japan. We saw photos of his shoes in a magazine, says Oldham. We followed up through Cal and a few weeks later, a package arrived. His shoes were inside, size 11 sneakers with cream white paint. John Oldham had taken his seat in row 31 of Cal 007 wearing those cream white paint spattered sneakers. Nothing was found by the joint US Japanese South Korean search and rescue salvage operations in international waters at the designated crash site or within the 225 square nautical mile, 770 square kilometers search area. Topic Hokkaido finds Eight days after the shootdown, human remains appeared on the north shore of Hokkaido, Japan. Hokkaido is about 30 miles 48 kilometers below the southern tip of Sakhalin across the La Perouse Strait. The southern tip of Sakhalin is 35 miles 56 kilometers from Moneron Island which is west of Sakhalin. The ICAO concluded that these objects were carried from Soviet waters to the shores of Hokkaido by the southerly current west of Sakhalin Island. All currents of the Strait of Tartary relevant to Moneron Island flow to the north, except this southerly current between Moneron Island and Sakhalin Island. These human remains, including body parts, tissues, and two partial torsos, totaled 13. All were unidentifiable, but one partial torso was that of a Caucasian woman as indicated by auburn hair on a partial skull, and one partial body was of an Asian child, with glass embedded. There was no luggage recovered. Of the non-human remains that the Japanese recovered were various items including dentures, newspapers, seats, books, eight cal paper cups, shoes, sandals, and sneakers, a camera case, a please fasten seat belt. Sign, an oxygen mask, a handbag, a bottle of dishwashing fluid, several blouses, an identity card belonging to 25 year old passenger Mary Jane Hendry of Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, Canada, and the business card of passenger Kathy Brown Spear. These items generally came from the passenger cabin of an aircraft. None of the items found generally came from the cargo hold of a plane, such as suitcases, packing boxes, industrial machinery, instruments, and sports equipment. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Russian diver reports. In 1991, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russian newspaper Izvestia published a series of interviews with Soviet military personnel who had been involved in salvage operations to find and recover parts of the aircraft. After three days of searching using trawlers, side-scan sonar, and diving bells, the aircraft wreckage was located by Soviet searchers at a depth of 174 meters 571 feet near Moneron Island. 
Since no human remains or luggage were found on the surface in the impact area, the divers expected to find the remains of passengers who had been trapped in the submerged wreckage of the aircraft on the seabed. When they visited the site two weeks after the shootdown, they found that the wreckage was in small pieces and no bodies. I had the idea that it would be intact. Well, perhaps a little banged up. The divers would go inside the aircraft and see everything there was to see. In fact it was completely demolished, scattered about like kindling. The largest things we saw were the braces which are especially strong. They were about one and a half or two meters long and 50 to 60 centimeters wide. As for the rest, broken into tiny pieces. According to Izvestia, the divers had only 10 encounters with passenger remains tissues and body parts in the debris area, including one partial torso. Tinro Ol Submersible Captain Mikhail Igorovich Gur's Diary, Submergence 10 October. Aircraft pieces, wing spars, pieces of aircraft skin, wiring, and clothing. But no people. The impression is that all of this has been dragged here by a troll rather than falling down from the sky. BX Lab Popoff. I will confess that we felt great relief when we found out that there were no bodies at the bottom. Not only no bodies, there were also no suitcases or large bags. I did not miss a single dive. I have quite a clear impression, the aircraft was filled with garbage, but there were really no people there. Why? Usually when an aircraft crashes, even a small one. As a rule there are suitcases and bags, or at least the handles of the suitcases. A number of civilian divers, whose first dive was on September 15, two weeks after the shootdown, state that Soviet military divers and trolls had been at work before them. Diver VX Lab Popov. As we learned then, before us the trawlers had done some work in the designated quadrant. It is hard to understand what sense the military saw in the trawling operation. First drag everything haphazardly around the bottom by the trawls, and then send in the submersibles? It is clear that things should have been done in the reverse order." ICAO also interviewed a number of these divers for its 1993 report. In addition to the scraps of metal, they observed personal items, such as clothing, documents and wallets. Although some evidence of human remains was noticed by the divers, they found no bodies. Political events Initial Soviet denial General Secretary Yuri Andropov, on the advice of Defense Minister Dmitry Ustinov, but against the advice of the Foreign Ministry, initially decided not to make any admission at downing the airliner, on the premise that no one would find out or be able to prove otherwise. Consequently the TASS news agency reported 12 hours after the shootdown only that an unidentified aircraft, flying without lights, had been intercepted by Soviet fighters after it violated Soviet airspace over Sakhalin. The aircraft had allegedly failed to respond to warnings and "...continued its flight toward the East Sea." Some commentators believe that the inept manner in which the political events were handled by the Soviet government was affected by the failing health of Andropov, who was permanently hospitalized in late September or early October 1983. Andropov died the following February. In a 2015 interview, Igor Kirillov, the senior Soviet news anchor, said that he was initially given a printed TASS report to announce over the news on September 1, which included an open and honest. Admission that the plane was shot down by mistake a wrong judgment call by the Far Eastern Air Defense Command. However, at the moment the opening credits of the Vremya Evening News program rolled in, an editor ran in and snatched the sheet of paper from his hand, handing him another TASS report which was "...completely opposite," to the first one and to the truth. U.S. reaction and further developments 
The shootdown happened at a very tense time in U.S.-Soviet relations during the Cold War. The U.S. adopted a strategy of releasing a substantial amount of hitherto highly classified intelligence information in order to exploit a major propaganda advantage over the Soviet Union. Six hours after the plane was downed, the South Korean government issued an announcement that the plane had merely been forced to land abruptly by the Soviets, and that all passengers and crew were safe. Secretary of State George P. Schultz held a press conference about the incident at 10.45 on September 1, during which he divulged some details of intercepted Soviet communications and denounced the actions of the Soviet Union. On September 5, 1983, President Reagan condemned the shooting down of the airplane as the Korean Airline Massacre, a crime against humanity that must never be forgotten, and an act of barbarism and inhuman brutality. The following day, the U.S. Ambassador to the UN Jean Kirkpatrick delivered an audio-visual presentation in the United Nations Security Council, using audio tapes of the Soviet pilots' radio conversations and a map of Flight 07's path in depicting its shooting down. Following this presentation, TASS acknowledged for the first time that the aircraft had indeed been shot down after warnings were ignored. The Soviets challenged many of the facts presented by the U.S., and revealed the previously unknown presence of a USAF RC-135 surveillance aircraft whose path had crossed that of Cal 007. On September 7, Japan and the United States jointly released a transcript of Soviet communications, intercepted by the listening post at Wakanai, to an emergency session of the United Nations Security Council. Reagan issued a national security directive stating that the Soviets were not to be let off the hook, and initiating, "...a major diplomatic effort to keep international and domestic attention focused on the Soviet action." The move was seen by the Soviet leadership as confirmation of the West's bad intentions. A high-level U.S.-Soviet summit, the first in nearly a year, was scheduled for September 8, 1983, in Madrid. The Schultz Gromyko meeting went ahead, but was overshadowed by the Cal 007 event. It ended acrimoniously, with Schultz stating, Foreign Minister Gromyko's response to me today was even more unsatisfactory than the response he gave in public yesterday. I find it totally unacceptable. Reagan ordered the Federal Aviation Administration FAA on September 15, 1983, to revoke the license of Aeroflot Soviet Airlines to operate flights to and from the United States. Aeroflot flights to North America were consequently available only through Canadian and Mexican cities, forcing the Soviet Foreign Minister to cancel his scheduled trip to the UN. Aeroflot service to the U.S. was not restored until April 29, 1986. An emergency session of the ICAO was held in Montreal, Canada. On September 12, 1983, the Soviet Union used its veto to block a United Nations resolution condemning it for shooting down the aircraft. Shortly after the Soviet Union shot down Cal 007, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, operating the commercial airports around New York City, denied Soviet aircraft landing rights, in violation of the United Nations Charter that required the host nation to allow all member countries access to the UN. In reaction, TASS and some at the UN raised the question of whether the UN should move its headquarters from the United States. Charles Lichtenstein, acting U.S. Permanent Representative to the UN under Ambassador Kirkpatrick, responded, We will put no impediment in your way. The members of the U.S. Mission to the United Nations will be down at the dockside waving you a fond farewell as you sail off into the sunset. Administration officials were quick to announce that Liechtenstein was speaking only for himself. In the Cold War context of Operation Ryan, the Strategic Defense Initiative, Pershing II missile deployment in Europe, and the upcoming exercise Able Archer, the Soviet government perceived the incident with the South Korean airliner to be a portent of war. The Soviet hierarchy took the official line that Cal Flight 007 was on a spy mission, as it flew deep into Soviet territory for several hundred kilometers, without responding to signals and disobeying the orders of interceptor fighter planes. 
Quote, dot, they claimed its purpose was to probe the air defenses of highly sensitive Soviet military sites in the Kamchatka Peninsula and Sakhalin Island. The Soviet government expressed regret over the loss of life, but offered no apology and did not respond to demands for compensation. Instead, the Soviet Union blamed the CIA for this criminal, provocative act. Topic: Investigations. Topic: NTSB. Since the aircraft had departed from U.S. soil and U.S. nationals had died in the incident, the National Transportation Safety Board (NTSB) was legally required to investigate. On the morning of September 1, the NTSB chief in Alaska, James Michelangelo, received an order from the NTSB in Washington at the behest of the State Department requiring all documents relating to the NTSB investigation to be sent to Washington, and notifying him that the State Department would now conduct the investigation. The U.S. State Department, after closing the NTSB investigation on the grounds that it was not an accident, pursued an ICAO investigation instead. Commentators such as Johnson point out that this action was illegal, and that in deferring the investigation to the ICAO, the Reagan administration effectively precluded any politically or militarily sensitive information from being subpoenaed that might have embarrassed the administration or contradicted its version of events. Unlike the NTSB, ICAO can subpoena neither persons nor documents and is dependent on the governments involved. In this incident, the United States, the Soviet Union, Japan, and South Korea to supply evidence voluntarily. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Initial ICAO investigation 1983. The International Civil Aviation Organization ICAO, had only one experience of investigation of an air disaster prior to the Cal 007 shootdown. This was the incident of February 21, 1973, when Libyan Arab Airlines Flight 114 was shot down by Israeli F-4 jets over the Sinai Peninsula. ICAO convention required the state in whose territory the accident had taken place the Soviet Union to conduct an investigation together with the country of registration, South Korea, the country whose air traffic control the aircraft was flying under, Japan, as well as the country of the aircraft's manufacturer, USA. The ICAO investigation, led by C.A.J. Frostel, did not have the authority to compel the states involved to hand over evidence, instead having to rely on what they voluntarily submitted. Consequently, the investigation did not have access to sensitive evidence such as radar data, intercepts, ATC tapes, or the flight data recorder FDR, and cockpit voice recorder CVR, whose discovery the USSR had kept secret. A number of simulations were conducted with the assistance of Boeing and Lytton, the manufacturer of the navigation system. The ICAO released their report December 2, 1983, which concluded that the violation of Soviet airspace was accidental. One of two explanations for the aircraft's deviation was that the autopilot had remained in heading hold instead of INS mode after departing Anchorage. They postulated that this in-flight navigational error was caused by either the crew's failure to select INS mode, or the inertial navigations not activating when selected, because the aircraft was already too far off track. It was determined that the crew did not notice this error or subsequently perform navigational checks, that would have revealed that the aircraft was diverging further and further from its assigned route. This was later deemed to be caused by a lack of situational awareness and flight deck coordination." The report included a statement by the Soviet government claiming, "...no remains of the victims, the instruments or their components or the flight recorders have so far been discovered." This statement was subsequently shown to be untrue by Boris Yeltsin's release in 1993 of a November 1983 memo from KGB head Viktor Chebrikov and Defense Minister Dmitry Ustinov to Yuri Andropov. 
This memo stated, "...in the third decade of October this year the equipment in question the recorder of in-flight parameters and the recorder of voice communications by the flight crew with ground air traffic surveillance stations and between themselves was brought aboard a search vessel and forwarded to Moscow by air for decoding and translation at the Air Force Scientific Research Institute." The Soviet government statement would further be contradicted by Soviet civilian divers who later recalled that they viewed wreckage of the aircraft on the bottom of the sea for the first time on September 15, two weeks after the plane had been shot down. Following publication of the report, the ICAO adopted a resolution condemning the Soviet Union for the attack. Furthermore, the report led to a unanimous amendment in May 1984 though not coming into force until October 1, 1998 to the Convention on International Civil Aviation that defined the use of force against civilian airliners in more detail. The amendment to Section 3 D reads in part, the contracting states recognize that every state must refrain from resorting to the use of weapons against civil aircraft in flight and that, in case of interception, the lives of persons on board and the safety of aircraft must not be endangered. U.S. <laughs> Air Force radar data It is customary for the Air Force to impound radar trackings involving possible litigation in cases of aviation accidents. In the civil litigation for damages, the United States Department of Justice explained that the tapes from the Air Force radar installation at King Salmon, Alaska pertinent to Calo 7's flight in the Bethel area had been destroyed and could therefore not be supplied to the plaintiffs. At first Justice Department lawyer Jan Van Flatten stated that they were destroyed 15 days after the shootdown. Later, he said he had «misspoken» and changed the time of destruction to 30 hours after the event. A Pentagon spokesman concurred, saying that the tapes are recycled for reuse from 24 to 30 hours afterwards. The fate of Cal 007 was known inside this time frame. Interim developments Hans Ephraimson Abd, whose daughter Alice Ephraimson Abd had died on the flight, chaired the American Association for Families of Cal 007 Victims. He single-handedly pursued three U.S. administrations for answers about the flight, flying to Washington 250 times and meeting with 149 State Department officials. Following the dissolution of the USSR, Ephraimson Arb persuaded U.S. Senators Ted Kennedy, Sam Nunn, Carl Levin, and Bill Bradley to write to the Soviet President, Mikhail Gorbachev requesting information about the flight. Glasnost reforms in the same year brought about a relaxation of press censorship, consequently reports started to appear in the Soviet press suggesting that the Soviet military knew the location of the wreckage and had possession of the flight data recorders. On December 10, 1991, Senator Jesse Helms of the Committee on Foreign Relations, wrote to Boris Yeltsin requesting information concerning the survival of passengers and crew of Cal 007 including the fate of Congressman Larry MacDonald. On June 17, 1992, President Yeltsin revealed that after the 1991 failed coup attempt concerted attempts were made to locate Soviet-era documents relating to Cal 007. He mentioned the discovery of a memorandum from KGB to the Central Committee of the Communist Party, stating that a tragedy had taken place and adding that there are documents which would clarify the entire picture. Yeltsin said the memo continued to say that these documents are so well concealed that it is doubtful that our children will be able to find them. On September 11, 1992, Yeltsin officially acknowledged the existence of the recorders, and promised to give the South Korean government a transcript of the flight recorder contents as found in KGB files. In October 1992, Hans Ephraimson Arb led a delegation of families and U.S. State Department officials to Moscow at the invitation of President Yeltsin. 
During a state ceremony at St. Catherine's Hall in the Kremlin, the Kalf family delegation was handed a portfolio containing partial transcripts of the Kal 007 cockpit voice recorder, translated into Russian, and documents of the Politburo pertaining to the tragedy. In November 1992, President Yeltsin handed the two recorder containers to Korean President Roh Tae-woo, but not the tapes themselves. The following month, the ICAO voted to reopen the Cal 007 investigation in order to take the newly released information into account. The tapes were handed to ICAO in Paris on January 8, 1993. Also handed over at the same time were tapes of the ground-to-air communications of the Soviet military. The tapes were transcribed by the Bureau d'Enquêtes et d'Analyses pour la Sécurité de l'Aviation Civile B in Paris in the presence of representatives from Japan, the Russian Federation, South Korea, and the United States. A 1993 official inquiry by the Russian Federation absolved the Soviet hierarchy of blame, determining that the incident was a case of mistaken identity. On May 28, 1993, the ICAO presented its second report to the Secretary General of the United Nations. Topic: <inaudible> Soviet Memoranda. In 1992, Russian President Boris Yeltsin disclosed five top-secret memos dating from a few weeks after the downing of Cal 007 in 1983. The memos contain Soviet communications from KGB chief Viktor Chebrikov and Defense Minister Dmitry Ustinov to General Secretary Yuri Andropov that indicated that they knew the location of Cal 07's wreckage while they were simulating a search and harassing the American Navy. They had found the sought after cockpit voice recorder on October 20, 1983, 50 days after the incident, and had decided to keep this knowledge secret, the reason being that the tapes could not unequivocally support their firmly held view that Cal 07's flight to Soviet territory was a deliberately planned intelligence mission. The third memo acknowledges that analysis of the recorder tapes showed no evidence of the Soviet interceptor attempting to contact Cal 007 via radio nor any indication that the Cal 007 had been given warning shots. However in case the flight recorders shall become available to the Western countries their data may be used for, confirmation of no attempt by the intercepting aircraft to establish a radio contact with the intruder plane on 121.5 MHz and no traces warning shots in the last section of the flight. That the Soviet search was simulated while knowing the wreckage lay elsewhere also is suggested by the article of Mikhail Prozumenshchikov, deputy director of the Russian State Archives of Recent History, commemorating the 20th anniversary of the airplane's shootdown. Commenting on the Soviet and American searches, "...since the USSR, for natural reasons, knew better where the Boeing had been downed." It was very problematical to retrieve anything, especially as the USSR was not particularly interested. Topic: <inaudible> Revised ICAO Report 1993. On November 18, 1992, Russian President Boris Yeltsin, in a goodwill gesture to South Korea during a visit to Seoul to ratify a new treaty, released both the Flight Data Recorder FDR and Cockpit Voice Recorder CVR of Cal 007. Initial South Korean research showed the FDR to be empty and the CVR to have an unintelligible copy. The Russians then released the recordings to the ICAO Secretary General. The ICAO report continued to support the initial assertion that Cal 007 accidentally flew in Soviet airspace, after listening to the flight crew's conversations recorded by the CVR, and confirming that either the aircraft had flown on a constant magnetic heading instead of activating the INS and following its assigned waypoints, or, if it had activated the INS, it had been activated when the aircraft had already deviated beyond the 71 halves nautical mile desired track envelope within which the waypoints would have been captured. In addition, the Russian Federation released "...transcript of communications. USSR. Air Defense Command Centers on Sakhalin Island." 
transcripts to ICAO. This new evidence triggered the revised ICAO report in 1993, the report of the completion of the fact-finding investigation, and is appended to it. These transcripts of two reels of tape, each containing multiple tracks, are time specified, some to the second, of the communications between the various command posts and other military facilities on Sakhalin from the time of the initial orders for the shootdown and then through the stalking of Cal 007 by Major Osipovich in his Su 15 interceptor. The attack is seen and commented on by General Kornikov, commander of Sokol Air Base, down the ranks to the combat controller Captain Titovnin. The transcripts include the post-attack flight of Cal 007 until it had reached Moneron Island, the descent of Cal 007 over Moneron, the initial Soviet SAR missions to Moneron, the futile search of the support interceptors for Cal 007 on the water, and ending with the debriefing of Osipovich on return to base. Some of the communications are the telephone conversations between superior officers and subordinates and involve commands to them, while other communications involve the recorded responses to what was then being viewed on radar tracking Cal 007. These multi-track communications from various command posts telecommunicating at the same minute and seconds as other command posts were communicating provide a composite picture of what was taking place, the data from the CBR and the FDI revealed that the recordings broke off after the first minute and 44 seconds of Cal 07's post-missile detonation 12-minute flight. The remaining minutes of flight would be supplied by the Russian 1992 submission to ICAO of the real-time Soviet military communication of the shootdown and aftermath. The fact that both recorder tapes stopped exactly at the same time 1 minute and 44 seconds after missile detonation 18 hours 38 minutes and 2 seconds coordinated universal time, without the tape portions for the more than 10 minutes of Cal 07's post-detonation flight before it descended below radar tracking 1838 coordinated universal time, finds no explanation in the ICAO analysis, it could not be established why both flight recorders simultaneously see to operate 104 seconds after the attack. The power supply cables were fed to the rear of the aircraft in raceways on opposite sides of the fuselage until they came together behind the two recorders. Topic. Passenger pain and suffering Passenger pain and suffering was an important factor in determining the level of compensation that was paid by Korean Airlines. Fragments from the proximity fused R-98 medium-range air-to-air missile exploding 50 meters 160 feet behind the tail caused punctures to the pressurized passenger cabin. When one of the flight crew radioed Tokyo area control one minute and two seconds after missile detonation his breathing was already accentuated", indicating to ICAO analysts that he was speaking through the microphone located in his oxygen mask, Korean Air 007R. We are rapid compressions. Descend to 10,000. Two expert witnesses testified at a trial before then Magistrate Judge Naomi Reese Buckwald of the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York. They addressed the issue of pre-death pain and suffering. Captain James McIntyre, an experienced Boeing 747 pilot and aircraft accident investigator, testified that shrapnel from the missile caused rapid decompression of the cabin, but left the passengers sufficient time to don oxygen masks. McIntyre testified that, based upon his estimate of the extent of damage the aircraft sustained, all passengers survived the initial impact of the shrapnel from the missile explosion. In McIntyre's expert opinion, at least 12 minutes elapsed between the impact of the shrapnel and the crash of the plane, and the passengers remained conscious throughout. <laughs> <laughs> Alternative hypotheses Flight 007 has been the subject of ongoing controversy and has spawned a number of conspiracy theories. 
Many of these are based on the suppression of evidence such as the flight data recorders, unexplained details such as the role of a USAF RC-135 surveillance aircraft, the untimely destruction of the U.S. Air Force's King Salmon radar data, or merely Cold War disinformation and propaganda. In addition, Gennady Osipovich, the Soviet fighter pilot who shot down Flight 007, continues to believe that he shot down a spy plane, when he really shot down a passenger aircraft. <laughs> Aftermath The FAA temporarily closed Airway R-20, the air corridor that Korean Air Flight 007 was meant to follow, on September 2. Airlines fiercely resisted the closure of this popular route, the shortest of five corridors between Alaska and the Far East. It was therefore reopened on October 2 after safety and navigational aids were checked. NATO had decided, under the impetus of the Reagan administration, to deploy Pershing II and cruise missiles in West Germany. This deployment would have placed missiles just 6 to 10 minutes striking distance from Moscow. Support for the deployment was wavering and it looked doubtful that it would be carried out. When the Soviet Union shot down Flight 007, the U.S. was able to galvanize enough support at home and abroad to enable the deployment to go ahead. The unprecedented disclosure of the communications intercepted by the United States and Japan revealed a considerable amount of information about their intelligence systems and capabilities. National Security Agency Director Lincoln D. Farah commented. As a result of the Korean Airlines affair, you have already heard more about my business in the past two weeks than I would desire. For the most part this has not been a matter of unwelcome leaks. It is the result of a conscious, responsible decision to address an otherwise unbelievable horror. Changes that the Soviets subsequently made to their codes and frequencies reduced the effectiveness of this monitoring by 60%. The U.S. Cal 007 Victims Association, under the leadership of Hans Ephraimson Abd, successfully lobbied U.S. Congress and the airline industry to accept an agreement that would ensure that future victims of airline incidents would be compensated quickly and fairly by increasing compensation and lowering the burden of proof of airliner misconduct. This legislation has had far-reaching effects for the victims of subsequent aircraft disasters. The U.S. decided to utilize military radars to extend air traffic control radar coverage from 200 to 1,200 miles 320 to 1,930 kilometers out from Anchorage. The FAA also established a secondary radar system on St. Paul Island. In 1986, the United States, Japan and the Soviet Union set up a joint air traffic control system to monitor aircraft over the North Pacific, thereby giving the Soviet Union formal responsibility to monitor civilian air traffic, and setting up direct communication links between the controllers of the three countries. President Reagan announced on September 16, 1983, that the Global Positioning System GPS, would be made available for civilian use, free of charge, once completed in order to avert similar navigational errors in the future. Furthermore, the interface of the autopilot used on large airliners was modified to make it more obvious whether it is operating in heading mode or ins mode. Alvin Snyder, the director of Worldwide Television for the United States Information Agency, was the producer of the video shown to the UN Security Council on September 6, 1983. In an article in the Washington Post on September 1, 1996, he stated that he had been given only limited access to the transcripts of the Soviet communication when he produced the video in 1983. When he received full insight into the Soviet transmissions in 1993, he says he realized that the Russians sick believed the plane to be an RC-135 reconnaissance plane, and that Osipovich the Soviet fighter pilot could not identify the plane and that he fired warning cannon shots and tipped his wings an international signal to force the plane to land 
Some of these statements were contradicted by the pilot in an interview with the New York Times, in which he confirmed that he did fire warning shots, but that they would not have been visible as they were not tracers. In a March 15, 2001, interview, Valery Kamensky, then commander of the Soviet Far East Military District Air Defense Force and direct superior to General Kornilkov, opined that such a shootdown of a civilian passenger plane could not happen again in view of the changing political conditions and alliances. In this interview, Kamensky stated, "...it is still a mystery what happened to the bodies of the crew and passengers on the plane." According to one theory, right after the rocket's detonation, the nose and tail section of the jumbo fell off and the mid-fuselage became a sort of wind tunnel so the people were swept through it and scattered over the surface of the ocean. Yet in this case, some of the bodies were to have been found during the search operations in the area. The question of what actually happened to the people has not been given a distinct answer. On September 1, 2003, commenting in a 20th anniversary of the shootdown article in RIA Novosti, Mikhail Prozumenshchikov, deputy director of the Russian State Archives of Recent History disclosed that the Soviet naval forces in the search for Cal 007 in international waters, already, "...knew better where it had been downed," while conducting their search, and that nothing was found, especially as the USSR was not particularly interested. In 2015, Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs declassified diplomatic documents which revealed that two months after the catastrophe, a high-ranking official of the U.S. administration confidentially informed Japan's diplomats that the Soviet Union had mistaken the aircraft with an American reconnaissance plane. Korean Air still flies from New York JFK International Airport to Seoul. However, the flight no longer stops at Anchorage or flies to Gimpo International Airport as it now flies directly to Incheon International Airport. Flight number 007 has been retired since, using flight numbers for two separate flights as 82, 86 and 250. As of September 2018, the separate flights now use an Airbus A380 and a Boeing 777. Topic popular culture Two television movies were produced about the incident, both films were produced before the fall of the Soviet Union allowed access to archives, Shootdown a telemovie starring Angela Lansbury, John Cullum, and Kyle Secor, was based on the book of the same title by R. W. Johnson, about the efforts of Nan Moore Lansbury, the mother of a passenger, to get answers from the U.S. and Soviet governments. The British Granada television documentary drama Coded Hostile, screened on September 7, 1989, detailed the U.S. military and governmental investigation, highlighting the likely confusion of Flight 007 with the USAF RC-135 in the context of routine USSIGINT, COMINT missions in the area. Written by Brian Phelan and directed by David Darlow, it starred Michael Murphy, Michael Moriarty, and Chris Sarandon. It was screened by HBO in the United States under the title Tailspin, behind the Korean airliner tragedy on August 20, 1989. An updated version of Coded Hostile was screened in the UK on August 31, 1993, incorporating details of the 1992 UN investigation. Tailspin, behind the Korean airliner tragedy Lee Greenwood has stated that he wrote the song God Bless the USA in response to his feelings about the shooting down of Korean Airlines Flight 007. The song just about wrote itself, Greenwood said in the book God Bless the USA by Greenwood and Gwen McLean. The words seemed to flow naturally from the music, and came out with total honesty. They were an expression of my feelings of pride. To me, America seemed just like a rookery, a place where we have a chance to grow, unmolested and free. KGO TV in San Francisco aired an advertisement in November 1983 for an upcoming news special report titled Green Street Reds, about suspicious activities at the Soviet consulate. In the ad, they depict Santa Claus and all his reindeer being blown out of the sky by a Soviet missile. The advertisement was produced by Davis, Johnson, Mogul and Columbato. Angry parents complained to KGO about the poor impression the image of Santa's death made upon young children. 
The incident is used as a plot point in the episode Brandy Station of Deutschland 83. Irish guitarist and singer Gary Moore's song Murder in the Skies was written about this incident. The song was included on Moore's album Victims of the Future, which was released two months after the shootdown in December 1983. Sri Lankan Baylor singer Anton Jones Sinhala song Korean Guwan Yanaya Korean Airplane discusses the incident. The Canadian television show Mayday on the National Geographic Channel covered this accident in a season 9 episode entitled Target is Destroyed. This tragedy was used as inspiration for the West Wing episode The Wake Up Call in which an Iranian fighter pilot shoots down a British airliner over the Caspian Sea. The airliner was off course and drifting into Iranian airspace. It is said that the airliner was mistaken by the pilot for an American RC-135 spy plane. The 2018 video game Phantom Doctrine depicts the shootdown as a part of a conspiracy by the Beholder Initiative to force the United States government to allow civilian access to GPS. The player's organization attempts to prevent the shootdown by cutting communications access from the ground, so that a mole within the Soviet military cannot give the order to shoot it down, but it turned out that the mole was actually the pilot of the Soviet interceptor, who had been previously instructed to shoot down the plane as part of Beholder's plan, and thus ignored the orders to hold fire. In the card-driven strategy game Twilight Struggle Soviet shootdown KAL-007", is a U.S. card that can potentially hand the U.S. an instant win, or otherwise greatly benefit the U.S. Maps See also Cold War 1979-85 History of the Soviet Union 1982-91 Korean Airlines Flight 007 transcripts Korean Airlines Flight 902 List of airliner shootdown incidents List of United States Congress members killed or wounded in office Notable decompression accidents and incidents Siberia Airlines Flight 1812 Iran Air Flight 655 Malaysia Airlines Flight 17 1983 Soviet nuclear false alarm incident, which happened three weeks later Footnotes Notes <laughs> 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 <laughs>